really an issue of can you trust God's word or not? And even if we're ridiculed, even if we're made fun of, even if we're disbelieved, we've got to keep the truth in front of people. Cosmology, geology, biology, the three major areas of science. God is the one who did it all. And those acknowledging that the Bible is true have dropped from about 50% to only about a third. And furthermore, about 4,000 churches close every year in America. If this was a business, we would be in crisis mode. And the reason is, God's word is being rejected from the beginning. So hang in there as we follow through on this class and we continue to start to walk through what science and reality really shows us about the accuracy of God's word. Welcome to the class on creation. Uh, but this isn't just a class about a bunch of facts of science. What is really going on in our culture is the attempt to lead the next generation away from the trust in God's word. It's really an issue of can you trust God's word or not. You see, in society today, God's word has literally lost all credibility to the young people. They may think it contains a few spiritual lessons, but they really don't trust it to mean what it says. Now that was Satan's initial, original attack upon the Word of God as he seeded into the mind of Eve the idea, did God really say that you would die if you eat from the knowledge of uh, good and evil? See, he cast doubt upon the trustworthiness of God's Word. And that has enormous implications in the trustworthiness people have toward the rest of the Bible. And that's what this class is about. Because science confirms God's word every single time we test it. Now, lest you think this doesn't have implications, let me take you to another culture of a couple generations ago. I'm going to take you back to 1939. In 1939, Hitler had taken over essentially all of continental Europe. He'd allied with Italy, he had taken over France, he'd taken over Poland, he'd taken over the Netherlands, the Scandinavian countries, and England knew it was next if it didn't do something. So they sent their entire army, all of their young men, the fathers, the brothers, across onto continental Europe to try to stop Hitler. And they lost battle after battle after battle to the point where they were literally pushed right up against the English Channel totally surrounded by the German forces. They couldn't be evacuated because the big battleships were too big to get more than dozens of men off at a time. Uh, so for days, they were expecting the Germans to move in and essentially the war would have been over. They would have killed or captured the majority of the English army uh, and England would have fallen. Now, in response to this, the King of England uh, made a speech to these young men who were about to die. And, and these were his words. These are final words to men who know they're about to die. Uh, King George said, and this was in May of 1940, the decisive struggle is now upon us, but let no one be mistaken. It's not a territorial conquest that our enemies are seeking. It's the overthrow, complete and final, of this empire and everything for which it stands. You see, Hitler didn't just want land. He wanted to control the way people think. He put the youth in the Hitler youth camps and said, you will think what I tell you to think, believe what I tell you to believe, and you train people long enough, that's exactly what they do. After that, said King George, it's the conquest of the world. It's a life and death struggle for all of us. And if their will prevails, the Nazi will, they will bring to accomplishment all the hatred and cruelty already displayed. Now this is a stirring speech to men on their final battle uh, as they're about to be captured or die. In response to this speech, the commanders of the forces sent back three words to the people of England. Three words they wanted their wives, their spouses, their sisters, their loved ones to hear. And those words were, but 
if not. But if not. Now those three words changed the history of the entire world. To understand how, you have to understand the mindset of the English people. You see, Germany long ago had decided God's word was just myths for the most part. The higher criticism picked apart everything God's word had to say. In other words, God's word isn't the judge over us. We are the judge over God's word. That was the mindset of the intellectuals of the day. England was moving that direction, but they still had strong Christian roots. And 60% of the people in England of that day said they believed the Bible. They believed it was true. They believed it was a revelation from the Lord. They attended church on a weekly basis. So that was England, 60% a Bible-believing Christian uh, culture. And when they heard those words, they understood they came out of the Bible. They were written 2,500 years earlier as another nation was captured by an evil world dictator, a despot. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he brought all the people back into uh, the land of Babylon, in, into the um, Babylonian Empire. Uh, and he said, you'll eat what I tell you to eat. You'll think what I tell you to think. I'm going to set up a golden idol. And if you don't bow down and worship it, you'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. And what happened next? Three young men looked the most powerful dictator in the world in the eye. And they said, we will not bow down and worship you. Because we serve a God capable of saving us from our, your fiery furnace. But if not, we don't control God. But we know he could save us. But even if he chooses not to, we still will not worship you. That resonated with the people of England. They understood what was being said because they were a Christian culture. Everybody who owned a sailboat or a pleasure boat or a power boat, any small vessel, literally tens of thousands of small vessels sailed across the channel at peril to their own life, brought back 350 of the 400 and the England hung on until America joined the war and ultimately defeated Hitler. Now that was England in 1940. Really, in action, in principle, in knowledge, a Christian nation. 60% church attending folks. Went from 60% to 6% in about two generations. Now what happened? How could that happen so rapidly? You see, while the church continues to teach about Jesus, teach spiritual principles, teach about morality, here's the Academy of Science in London, England, and here comes a group of school children into that academy where they are seeing signs like this. The myth of the global flood began maybe 5,000 years ago as a story to explain fossil seashells and we had to a debate about the biblical story of Noah and the flood. You see, what's really being said is, come into our cathedral of truth, children, where you can hear about reality and science, and you can forget all those nonsensical stories you've been hearing in the Bible. In other words, you can't trust God's word. It's not what it says, but that's what's implied. You can't trust God's word. You have to trust what the museums and scientists are telling you. Or science like this, how special are the human genes? Why did you know you have a lot in common with a fruit fly? Or you're almost identical to the DNA of a chimpanzee? Or more to the point, science like this. Did you know that you belong to the ape family? You see, that's why we're losing our culture because the church quit showing how God's word is connected to science and the two reinforce each other. See, today, if you look at the church in America, just in the last 20 years, the number of people willing to call themselves Christians have dropped from 86% to 78%. Only 8%. That represents tens of millions of people who have walked away from any trust in the Bible. Weekly church attendance has dropped from about half our culture to a third. Unchurched families have rose from a fourth of our culture to well over a third of the culture. And those acknowledging that the Bible is true have dropped from about 50% to only about a third. And furthermore, about 4,000 churches close every year in America. If this was a business, we would be in crisis mode. And the reason is God's word is being rejected from the beginning. So hang in there as we follow through on this class and we continue to start to walk through what science and reality really shows us 
about the accuracy of God's Word. I have noticed that the things that are really important in Scripture, God goes out of His way to make them absolutely 100% crystal clear. He repeats them multiple times in multiple ways. Now, the early parts of Genesis are exactly like that. You see, ten times in the very first chapter of the Bible, He says, creatures reproduce after their own kind. Birds reproduce after their own kind. Fish reproduce after their own kind. Cattle reproduce after their own kind. Trees reproduce after their own kind. Now that's just another way of saying, trees only make trees. Fish only make fish. Birds only make birds. As we observe the world around us, that's exactly what we see. If you ignore what God tells us, the only alternative is that something must have turned into something else that eventually turned into a dog or a mammal that eventually turned into something else that was walking upright that eventually turned into people. Something turned into something that turned into something else. Or God created very different groupings of animals. Now see, that is biology. That's the very foundation for understanding the entire biological world. Do you realize what's going on around us is simply we are misinterpreting biology because we've made up a story to try to explain everything as if God does not exist. That's all evolution is. The second thing you come to in God's Word is the understanding of why does death exist. You see, in a very clear way, God's Word tells us we were made to fellowship with a totally pure, totally holy God. But we chose to rebel against Him. We chose to ignore Him. We chose to say, I don't want you to be God. I want to be God. That's all we did when we rebelled against God. We are now separated from Him. We're sinful. He is not. Sinfulness can't live in close fellowship with purity. There is a chasm separating us from a holy God at this point. He destroyed a pristine, perfect creation for our benefit so that we would not live forever and be forever separated from Him. You see, death is actually an act of mercy on the part of God. And then, because rebellion and sin and evil has to require a payment by a just God, He came and took that payment upon Himself. He took death upon Himself. His very Son died for us so that we could come back in fellowship with Him. You see, not understanding where death comes from, thinking it's been around for millions and billions of years and it's just the way things have always been, distorts the very image of what God has done and who He is when He came and died for us. The Gospel message starts with understanding in a real event that really happened in real time and real space, the fall, the rebellion against God, the entrance of death into creation, it's our cause. It's not the way God made things. But then, how do you explain everything? How do you explain the rocks? How do you explain the fossils? For instance, as we dig down into the rock layers, we find critters like this. Now, this is a fossil. It's, it's an animal that used to be alive. It's called a trilobite. It's been found in a layer of rock. How did it get there? You see, it doesn't come with a label attached. The Bible spends more time at the beginning, in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, talking about a world covering deluge than it does talking about the creation of the entire universe and the hundreds of trillions of stars in the universe. You see, it's important. It's crystal clear. God said, I will never send another flood upon the earth, but there's been thousands of floods on the earth. Either God's a liar or there's something very different about the flood talked about in Genesis. He said, every hill under heaven upon the earth was covered with water. See, that's very specific. Uh, and it means a total world covering deluge. Now that has enormous implications in geology. We'll just talk about one of those in a few minutes. But if we leave that out of our thinking, if we leave the reality that there really has been this world covering flood upon the earth, we're going to misinterpret the rocks. We're going to misinterpret the fossils and how they got there. We're going to misunderstand everything about the geology of this planet because we've left the truth out of our thinking at the very start. 
See, it's not that scientists are stupid. It's simply they're starting from the wrong foundation because they start by leaving God's word out. And then after this flood, people spread out across the earth. And then in the most momentous event of all history of the entire universe, the one who made the universe entered into it as a human being. But why? To take the penalty of death that we deserve upon himself. You see, this is reality. This is science. And science has to conform to reality. We all have the same rocks. We all have the same fossils. It's just how are we going to interpret them? Now, I ran across a verse a few years ago, and it's Psalms 146, um, verses 5 and 6. And it says this. It says, happy is he whose hope is in the Lord his God. You see, our happiness isn't in our money. Our happiness doesn't come. Our inner peace doesn't come from our welfare, our health, our possessions, our prestige. All of those will leave us empty ultimately. True contentment can only come when we make the God who made everything the Lord of our life. That's what it's saying. But then it goes on to define, so who is this God that we should make Lord? That verse in Psalm says, He is the one who made the heavens, semicolon. He's the one who made the earth and the sea, semicolon. And he's the one who made everything therein. Now this is really interesting, because this was written by King David 2,500 years ago, long before modern science was ever developed, okay? Nobody had heard the word science. Nobody systematically started studying the creation. And yet he laid out these three areas. God is the one who made the heavens. That is astronomy. That is astrophysics. That is thermodynamics, the study of time, space, and matter, and where did it come from. He's the one who made the earth and the sea. That's the earth sciences, geology, paleontology, oceanography, the study of the physical world around us, and all that is therein contained. That is biology and microbiology and zoology and medicine, the medical biological fields, cosmology, geology, biology, the three major areas of science. God is the one who did it all. Now what I'd like to do for the remainder of this session is just take one example from each of those areas to show you how absolutely obvious God wants the truth to be. His word means what it says. There's certain things only he could have done. Yes, the universe and the world around us operates by natural laws of science that we can discover and then use for our own benefit. But in certain cases, God told us I did things outside of the natural laws of science. Now, we're going to start with the cosmological sciences, what I call the great mysteries of science. The first one is star formation. Where did stars come from? Now you'll see big charts of big gas clouds that supposedly condensed to form stars, and little gas clouds that condensed to form smaller stars, and they're all lined up. Huge, enormous stars the size of our entire solar system, smaller stars the size of our sun, uh, small neutron stars pouring out enormous amounts of energy, black holes. There's an enormous variety in space, and they'll, they'll line them up as if one turned into another that turned into another, and you can explain everything by stellar evolution. Now here's an enormous quandary for modern people, scientists, trying to explain the universe without God. You see, stars are an enormous ball of gas, hydrogen gas primarily, and there's nuclear fusion going on in the center of a star. Uh, the, the hydrogen combines and spews out enormous amounts of energy and dissociates itself and burns, it basically burns itself up and turns into energy. Matter turning into energy. We know this happens. Enormous amounts of energy. It's where the heat and the light comes from, from the sun, but it means it's burning up its fuel. It's like a log when you burn it up, it eventually disappears and there's no wood left. Well, if the stars are using up their fuel, eventually they're going to disappear and as it turns out, we know how fast this happens, and most of the stars in the universe couldn't possibly be as old as we're told the universe is. So why are they still there? If the universe is 15 billion years old and all the fuel would be gone within a few billion years, why are the stars there? Scientists are 
forced to believe stars are constantly remaking themselves. They're just popping into existence all over the universe. And that's what's taught. It's taught in the museums, it's taught in the cosmos specials, it's taught in the textbooks. Stars are constantly remaking themselves. Well, let's look at the laws of science to see could this be true or not. There's a law of science called the natural gas law that says gas always moves from high pressure out to low pressure. See, gas molecules are bouncing around, bumping into each other, and the tighter you pack them together, the more force there is, the more energy, the more heat builds up to force them apart. So if you just leave gas to do what gas will do, it will always spread out. It won't condense and pack tighter and tighter together. That's a law of science. Now, a law is a law of science only if there's never been an exception, never been an observation, never been a theory to contradict it. It is always true, 100% of the time. Well, let's do an experiment. I have here a can of gas. Now, the gas in this can, the molecules are tightly compact together. The gas in this room, the molecules are spread far apart. And the only thing separating the two is a valve in the top. Now, for a star to form, it would be like all of the gas in this room to pack itself tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter together into this can when I open the valve, all by itself. Science is about experimentation. So I'm going to open the valve and we're going to see what happens. Does all the gas from this room pack itself down inside of this can, or do the high pressure molecules in this can spread out into the room? I always tell audiences, you might want to hold your breath because we are constantly told stars form all by themselves. It'd be like the gas packing itself out of this room into the can. So three, two, one. And which way does the gas go? 100% of the time, outward, out of the can. And in space, the molecules are spread a trillion times farther apart than in this room. What could possibly make them pack themselves tighter together. Gravity is too weak to cause those molecules to pack together. The natural gas law shows us it could never happen. You see, science shows us stars exist because something outside the laws of science made them occur. The other thing is, as we look at the universe around us, we see enormous numbers of stars. There's 100 billion galaxies the side of the Milky Way each believed to contain about 100 billion stars. That's 10 with 22 zeros after it, number of stars. If you divide that number of stars by how old we're told the universe is, it turns out we should see about 10,000 stars forming every second. 10,000 more up there tonight. 10,000 more the next second. 10,000 more the next second. 10,000 more the next second to explain them all. We have looked at every little part of outer space with the Hubble Space Telescope and enormous telescopes, and no one has ever taken a picture 10 years ago, taken a picture of the same part of outer space today, and wow, there's a new star. Here on this page is what it looked like 10 years ago. Here on this page of the textbooks, what it looks like today. There's a new star. Not once. Never. We've never observed a new star forming. The laws of science show us gas could never pack together all by itself to form a star. Explanations are thrown out, well, like maybe supernova shock waves force the gas together. But to have a shock wave, it would come from one direction and spread the gas up in front of it. You'd have to have simultaneously shock waves in all directions. You can make up equations and mathematics to pretend it happened. But in reality, we've never seen it happen and the laws of science say it won't happen. Now, scientists acknowledge this. Here's just a few quotes. Here's a scientist who says, the origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of astrophysics because it can't happen. It violates the laws of science. Here's another expert. Now, this guy believes in evolution because he, that's the way he's been trained to think, but he's acknowledging science agrees with God's word. Something outside of natural phenomenon must have happened because the laws of science say it couldn't have happened by itself. He says, if a star did not exist, it would be easy to prove we'd never expect it to. And one last quote. Th this astrophysicist said, most of us are persuaded that stars form out of diffuse matter, which has to condense or contract. In other words, gas clouds coming closer and closer and closer and closer together, like the gas suck it down into the can when you open the valve. Never happens. But when we observe gas clouds in outer space, 
nearly all, or probably all of them, if we're really accurate, show that stuff is flowing outward, not compressing inward. You see, God wants the truth to be known. And in the area of physics, astronomy, cosmology, he's made the truth absolutely obvious. Now, second subject, we want to talk about the geological sciences. And once again, I just want to give you one example from this. See, the most common type of rock on the face of the earth is sedimentary rock. It's particles of matter that have been basically ripped up and redistributed and packed down to form the rock layers of the earth. Sandstone, limestone, uh, shale, coal, these are all sediments, other particles or pieces that have been jam-packed to form a rock layer that we find around us. There's a commonality in all of these layers of rock. They were all formed under water. Do you realize at the top of Mount Everest, 29,000 feet above sea level, we find fossilized seashells. Now, what's a seashell doing at the top of Mount Everest? Did a clam one day decide, oh, I think I'll go climb the mountain and climb 29,000 feet from sea level to the top? No, those rock layers were underwater before the mountains were pushed up. We'll talk much more about Noah's flood and the impact on geology later, but the mountains of today form subsequent to the flood. You don't have to have 29,000 feet of water on the earth because the mountains were pushed up at the end of the flood as the continental plates were moving around. And 75% of the exposed surface of the earth is covered with this sedimentary rock. Furthermore, getting back to our little trilobite friend here, when animals die today, they don't form fossils. You know, in the middle, late 1800s, there were enormous herds of buffalo roaming around on the Great Plains. I mean, unfathomably large numbers of enormous animals. Well, the uh, great game hunters of the day discovered that if they can identify and shoot the lead buffalo, the rest of the buffalo wouldn't stampede. And they could just sit there and shoot buffalo after buffalo after buffalo. And over a period of 20 to 50 years, they drove the buffalo to the point of extinction, wiping out enormous herds. They basically skinned them and left the rest to rot. So there were hundreds of million of buffalo carcasses laying all over the Great Plains in the 1800s. And yet today, you can't find a single buffalo fossil. When your fish dies in a fish tank, it either bloats and floats or drops to the bottom. Eventually, it doesn't turn into a fossil. It is eaten by scavengers and bacteria and crabs and other critters, and it doesn't fossilize. To form a fossil, you have to bury an animal very deeply and very rapidly. Otherwise, it's going to decay and disappear. And yet the rock layers are filled with tremendous numbers of fossils. Furthermore, the very nature of the fossil record doesn't match what we find in fossils. You see clams tightly jammed together, unopened, just, just with their shells completely closed. When a clam dies, it immediately opens up, and they don't live tightly packed together. See, they were washed together as similar size, shape, and density objects, and packed probably hundreds of feet below sediment, so deep they couldn't dig their way out. Clams are marvels of digging. They can dig their way out of anything, and yet they couldn't because the flood was so catastrophic in its nature. We find dinosaur bones buried with sea creatures, buried with seaweed. We find tropical creatures buried with creatures that live in tundra, all just washed together in huge jumbles because this flood was catastrophic and worldwide in nature and it brought animals and vegetation from different habitats together. And furthermore, it doesn't take a long time to form a fossil. They closed a mine over in Australia in the 1920s as the value of the minerals came up, they reopened it in the 70s. And lo and behold, one of the miners had left his leather hat laying in the, the mineral-filled sediment there in the mine. But when they pulled that hat out, they discovered it had totally fossilized. The leather and the felt had turned to solid rock in only 60 years. See, it doesn't take millions of years to form a fossil. It only takes the right conditions. And after the worldwide flood, the conditions would have been optimum for this. You see, we all have the same rocks, we all have the same fossils, we all have the same data. It's how are you going to interpret them. 
And if you leave God's word out, you're going to misinterpret the fossils in the rock layers of the earth. And you're going to misinterpret the time frame of when all this happened to have created these fossils. The third area where God has made the truth absolutely apparent for his existence is the biological world. The biological world around us is an absolute marvel of complexity. It is made out of literally tens of thousands of perfectly designed parts, which could never have come together on their own. As a matter of fact, the biological world does something that nothing mankind has ever made could possibly do, and that is to make perfectly reproduced copies of itself. I mean, I'm not talking about the software and the DNA code where a copy is made of a copy. I mean the hardware itself. Imagine putting a computer on a counter and coming back the next morning and a totally reproduced copy of the original computer is sitting there. That's what life does. Now even the parts of life down to their very chemical structure is unbelievably complex. The most common molecule of life are the protein molecules. Now our bodies are made up of literally tens of thousands, up to a hundred thousand very specifically designed different proteins. You see a protein molecule is made up of a bunch of little beads or what would be represented as a bead. You'll notice there's different colors, blue and purple and red and pink and clear. Actually proteins of life have 20 different colors, there's 20 different amino acids and they link up like a necklace to form a long chain that bends and folds. If it bends and folds in a certain way it might be hard like a fingernail, bends and folds in a different way, and it turns into things like hemoglobin in our blood. The shape of the protein to perform its function depends on the order in which the beads are aligned. Now let me show you a fairly long representation of a protein. See, each of the beads is in a different order, each of the colors is in a different spot. For random processes to have created this, it would have to put every single color in exactly the right spot. Now let's take a look at how long this protein molecule actually is in a living organism. Now every single color, every single amino acid has to be in exactly the right spot or it's the wrong molecule. It doesn't bend and twist and fold in the right way. And this is just one of a hundred thousand or more of these that are in our body. It is an astronomical statistical impossibility for random chance to have created even one of these molecules, let alone all of the ones needed for life to exist. As a matter of fact, even if you had all of the right proteins and all the right enzymes and all of the DNA and everything somehow miraculously just came together somewhere in a pond, it still would never come alive. You see, we've performed an experiment a billion times last year where we take all the chemicals needed for life and we put them in a container and then we allow heat to pass in and out of the container. It's an open thermodynamic system. And then we'll open the container and see have we formed some new form of life? You see, it's canned food. Everything you have for life is in there. If this was tuna fish, all the chemicals are here. If this is corn, everything you need for corn is there. And yet you never open your can of tuna fish and out comes some new alien life creature. So when you do experiments, it shows life does not form. One more example from biology, because the, the earth is filled with enormously complex creatures that are made of many parts that all have to be there at the same time. There's one creature God has made, and it's called the leaf hopper. There's actually 20,000 different species. Now, that means he made the leaf hopper kind with its DNA code capable of varying widely, but the leaf hopper always stays a leaf hopper. Now think of the leaf hopper as a grasshopper on steroids, the Olympic athlete of insects on steroids. When it jumps, especially the very small nymph, the young leaf hopper, it takes off with 100 times the acceleration of gravity, 100 g-forces on its body. Now a jet pilot will often reach 10 or more g's and so much blood is draining from the pilots they're put in pressure suits so they don't black out and they're in danger of doing so at 10 g-forces. Now this insect takes off at 10 times that speed and acceleration. They test these guys in centrifuges that spin them around and around. I want to show you what 10 g-forces looks like on the human face. Now you see that's a lot of force. 
the, the whole skin and muscles are being shoved backwards by that much force. If a leaf hopper was the size of a human being, uh, it's obviously we're, we're a thousand times bigger, it would be like us jumping, accelerating from one to 200 miles per hour within seconds and landing a fourth of a mile or more away. The enormous speed, enormous acceleration, enormous abilities. Now, here's the issue. So his little leaf hopper brain says jump. Now the signal has to move down his back to both legs, but the muscles in his legs react so fast that it is literally impossible for both legs to contract and move simultaneously. Now what do you think is going to happen if the signal reaches one leg faster than the other and one of those muscles contracts sooner than the other and he takes off at 100 times the acceleration of gravity with one leg faster than the other? Well, he's going to spiral sideways. His little insect brain is going to smash into the nearest tree, end of the leaf hopper. But God wanted to design a creature with this capability. So what is he going to do? Well, it took many years for scientists to figure this out. They dissected the critters, and deep inside of them, this is what they found. Now, isn't that absolutely incredible? Two perfectly designed intermeshing gears that are connected to the leg muscles so that if one of those legs starts to move faster than the other, those gears force both legs to move in perfect sequence and the, the little insect will take off in a, in a parallel direction instead of spinning sideways. Now how in the world could some mutational change, one little random change at a time to some insect that didn't have those gears, have turned something into those two perfectly intermeshing gears? I mean, it would literally be like this. Some creature that didn't have the gears inside of it must have something that looked like just some sort of round blobs, some little tumors of some sort growing inside of the insect. Now those aren't intermeshing gears. They don't lock and force one leg to work in concert with the other leg. Well, a mutation is a random change. It is literally like walking up to this thing that isn't a gear and hitting it with a hammer. Next hour, hit it with a hammer, hit it with a hammer, hit it with a hammer. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, I'm hitting something that's not a gear with a hammer. Is that ever going to turn it into a gear? As a matter of fact, it can't just be a gear. You have to have one gear that perfectly intermeshes with another gear and works in concert along with the nerves and the functions and the instincts. You'd have to form a left-hand set of intermeshing gears along with a right-hand set of intermeshing gears by randomly hitting something that's not a gear with a hammer. That's all a mutation is, a random change to the programming of a creature. Isn't it absolutely obvious? It is literally impossible for mutations in natural selection to have created some perfectly working, functioning gears inside of an insect. Let alone just that feature, there are thousands of other features just as complex that never have, could have formed by random mutational changes. You see, every form of life had to have been fully formed, fully functional, created by an unfathomably intelligent creator to explain their existence. And God did it this way, and he gave us the laws of science so we could know what the truth was. He had to have created such creatures. If God has made the truth so obvious, why can't very intelligent people see it? I've, I've honestly been struggling with this for about 20 years. Why can't people see what God has made so obvious? Well, a revelation came to me a few years ago, and, and it had to do with a film I watched when I was a young man. Uh, uh, and I'm going to show you that film in just a second. But, but first I want to kind of lay out exactly what God's told us in many, many ways over and over again. But Psalm 119 verses 104 and 105 is probably one of the clearest uh, statements. From thy precepts I get understanding. In other words, from what God has told us is where I get my understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. 
That should be our goal and our cry too. I want to know the truth. But then it gets even more specific. And I'm sure you've heard this part of the verse. Your word is the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. You see, it is God's word is where we must start to examine reality, examine biology, examine geology, examine history. And if we leave God's word out, it's like we're leaving out the lamp. We're leaving out the light and we're going to come to the wrong conclusion. But it honestly is even much worse than that. We literally blind ourselves to what is actually true. See, there was a scientist a few years ago who decided to find out what happens if I was to put a lens in front of my eye that will turn the image upside down. You see, the way God designed our eyes and our mind is that there's a lens in our eye, and as the image is coming through that lens, it flips it upside down. So as you are looking at me, it looks like I am sitting right side up, but the image in the back of your eye, I am actually upside down. But your brain takes that upside down image and it flips it right side up. So let's find out what happens when we put an extra lens so for the first time, things are right side up in the back of your brain. If seeing were done only in the eye, everything would be upside down to us. Just as in a camera, the lens of the eye forms the image upside down. The image is then inverted by the brain so that it appears right side up. Now, what would happen if a lens system were used to form the image right side up? Well, the brain would immediately invert the image so that it would be upside down. But would this condition be permanent? To answer this question, we asked Mr. Gratz, our optical expert, to design for us a pair of inverting spectacles. While the spectacles were being constructed in our shop, we faced the problem of who was going to wear the things continuously for several weeks. You'll want to meet our unlucky winner. That's right, me. Even from the first, it was possible to walk in this topsy-turvy fashion. But it didn't take long to develop a rollicking case of seasickness. We decided that for your sake as well as ours, we'd better conduct our first test sitting down. However, just sitting down wasn't so easy. Even the simplest tasks were at first impossible. No amount of concentration or effort could overcome the compulsion to reach in the wrong direction. The inverting spectacles had to be worn every waking moment during the entire period of the experiment. Anytime the glasses were removed, the eyes were closed or fully covered. Walking to work upside down was an exhausting experience but it provided a valuable period of relearning and reorientation. It also caused quite a stir in the neighborhood. Gradually it became easier to get around in this upside down world. By a slow and painful process, the image in the brain had been erected. At this point, we decided to devise a convincing demonstration showing that reorientation had been achieved. The test with the motorcycle went so well that we decided to extend the experiment to flying an airplane where visual coordination and depth perception are even more critical. The flight lasted more than an hour, during which all normal flight maneuvers were executed. In performing the experiment with the inverting spectacles, we became very much aware of how important it is that seeing is done in the brain, not just in the eye. Now, it took about two weeks before that image was right side up again. His brain had taken something and it turned it 180 degrees. It took what was now 
backwards from what it used to be, and it made it the new reality. And it wasn't after about a week things were at 45 degrees, and after 10 days things were at 70 degrees. It's like his brain just kept getting information and getting information, and finally decided, this must be the truth. Now I'm going to filter everything in this new way. Interestingly, once he took the glasses off, it took about two weeks for everything to flip back again. Without the glasses, everything was upside down as he was walking around. And it took a while for his brain to readjust again. Now there's a profound observation by the man who's been called the father of modern psychology, Dr. William James. After a lifetime of study, he said, this is how the human brain works. There is nothing so absurd, but that if you repeat it often enough, people won't believe it. You see, if you tell something to somebody over and over and over and over again to the exclusion of anything else, no matter how ridiculous, they're eventually going to become convinced it's true. And not only that, they'll get to the point where they can't even consider any other possibility. Do you realize what's happening in our entire education system? They're being told over and over and over again that one animal turned into another, that there have been billions of years of Earth history, that bacteria turned into people, and that the Bible is absolutely wrong. So what are they going to conclude? They don't hear it contradicted in the church. For the most part, they're not hearing why that couldn't be true. So they come to believe it's true, and therefore believe God's Word can't be trusted about biology, can't be trusted about geology, can't be trusted about history. So why trust it about anything else? You see, all of those things in the beginning of the Bible are true. There were separate kind of creatures created. There was a worldwide flood. Death is here because of our actions. So if the problem is they're being taught a lie over and over and over and over again, what's the solution? It's to teach them the truth and the evidence that supports this truth over and over and over again. Even if we're ridiculed, even if we're made fun of, even if we're disbelieved, we've got to keep the truth in front of people. And I hope this session helped start to lay the groundwork for how clear God has made and wants the truth to be.